Everyone dreams of a bright future, but for people living in or near poverty, the odds are stacked against them. Change doesn't happen overnight. That's why Episcopal Community Services has built Mindset, a three to five year program that partners with people to help them achieve their goals and move out of poverty for good. Mindset is the first program in Philadelphia using an evidence-informed coaching methodology that empowers people to identify their strengths, define their vision of success, and achieve it with self-determination. Free for all accepted participants, Mindset provides a two-to-one savings match to help people build financial security. Mindset gives Sharon hope for a secure future. Sharon was living paycheck to paycheck, taking care of her young son and paying down a loan from an unfinished degree. They are healthy and have a supportive network, but their comfort was fragile. In Mindset, Sharon was paired with her coach, James, who works with Sharon at a pace that fits her life. About 10 hours a month that includes coaching sessions, workshops, and consultations with a team of specialists that offer expert insight into things like career and finances. Mindset meets people where they are and helps them get to where they want to be. The program examines the whole person in five key areas of life, housing and family stability, health and well-being, financial security, education, and employment. Though separate, these pillars are interconnected. Change in one, up or down, can affect another. With James, Sharon identifies larger goals and breaks them down into smaller, more attainable ones that ladder up. Sharon knew she wanted a career that would be more lucrative and fulfilling, so she considered her strengths and researched the job market. She decided to pursue recording and audio engineering. Sharon needed a degree for that, so she researched class schedules and established a savings plan to purchase a new laptop. These gains helped Sharon re-enroll in LaSalle University's online learning, where she could finish her degree. For attending 95% of her classes each semester, Sharon receives a small monetary incentive. Her achievements are recognized and her continued growth is rewarded. As goals get bigger, so do the rewards, and a larger one will be given upon graduation. As the coaching process is repeated, it becomes internalized and Sharon builds the skills and confidence to tackle future goals independently. Moving from one distinct stage of your life to another takes time. Some life changes are planned for, like earning a college degree. Others are unexpected, like the setbacks everyone has experienced from the pandemic. Life's path is rarely a straight line. Mindset helps Sharon stay focused on her goals and tackle life's unexpected obstacles. She navigates her journey and Mindset supports her along the way. Sharon has three more years left in Mindset. The more she levels up in life, the more she believes in herself and what she's capable of achieving. Sharon envisions her life three years from now. She has a job she loves, makes enough to keep savings, and can set a strong foundation for her son. He'll grow up knowing that he can achieve what he puts his mind to, just like his mom. Though the mindset journey looks different from person to person, it has the same end result. Financial security in a savings account, a fulfilling career with opportunities to advance, and self-determination in life. Imagine how much you can achieve in five years. To learn more about our work, visit ecsphilly.org forward slash mindset. creative way to illustrate how mindset works. This video makes me proud of the meaningful collaboration work done between mindset coaches and participants. My name is Fred Sutherland and I'm president of the board of trustees of ECS. And I wanna thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate this transformational work of ECS in conjunction with our participants. Now, some of you are loyal supporters of ECS and some of you are new to ECS. So let me just take a minute and briefly describe ECS's mission. Very simple to state and very hard to accomplish. And that mission in a nutshell is to challenge and reduce intergenerational poverty in Philadelphia. 
to empower individuals and families to determine and follow their own paths towards upward economic mobility and to ultimate economic independence. And that's what we're really here to celebrate tonight. So we envision a world where the path to prosperity is available to all. So tonight we're going to focus on the Kochi methodology behind the program we adopted several years ago, which we call Mindset. As you saw in the video, we help transform lives by partnering with Philadelphians as they set and achieve goals towards economic independence. Now you'll hear diverse voices this evening, including two trustees who were involved in the pivoting of ECS uh, into the Mindset program, a Mindset coach and participant who will describe their journeys, and a new ECS donor who will describe her decision to support Mindset. And we have a couple of surprises along the way. Too many times, well-meaning nonprofits and government organizations continue to do the work the same way year after year after year, even when evidence suggests that a new approach is needed. But through the Mindset Program, ECS is, uh, is pursuing a new path. This is a path that is informed by the science behind intergenerational poverty. And it's focused on the key drivers of poverty, as you heard in the video, education, employment, housing, health, and financial stability. And it's based on a comprehensive coaching model, which is uh, pursued in partnership with our participants. ECS has the flexibility to shift our focus where the needs are greatest and where, where we can have the most meaningful impact thanks to over 150 years of generous donor support. So again, thank you for making all of this possible. And now I have the pleasure of introducing two other members of the ECS Board of Trustees, Cynthia Muse and Judy Sullivan. Cynthia is a retired educator, educator in the Philadelphia Public School System, is a director of instruction for the School District of Philadelphia, Cynthia, Cynthia Master Techniques for creating a high performance culture and enhancing performance through effective coaching. Her responsibilities included organizational management and leadership training. Cynthia is a lifelong member of the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas. The very Reverend Judith Sullivan is the Dean of the Philadelphia Episcopal Cathedral. Led by Dean Sullivan, a growing cathedral community is serving the neighborhood with a variety of ministries and welcomes all to its weekly worship and diocesan events. In the Diocese of Pennsylvania, she is a member of the Council of Deans and the co-chair of the Loving Presence Commission, which is focusing on dismantling racism. Judy is a recent past chair of the Board of Directors of Interfaith Philadelphia. So at this point, let me turn it over to remarks by Cynthia and Judy. Thank you, Fred, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for your interest in ECS's mission, work, and outcomes. Judy and I are so proud to serve on ECS's Board of Trustees. Not only has ECS be, been serving Philadelphians in need for over 150 years, but the organization has been able to adapt to the changing needs of the community throughout history. It takes courage and dedicated staff work to continuously prove and change approaches when research shows that there are better ways. So Judy, let's think back and describe how we shifted our approach four years ago. You were on the strategic planning committee of the board at that time. From your point of view, tell us what happened. Well, Cynthia, I share your enthusiasm for ECS's history of direct service to Philadelphians in need. Back in 2017, we knew that ECS was doing very important and essential work in the city in emergency housing and out of school time programs, youth and workforce development. And yet the ECS staff saw that it was difficult to document that our participants were actually escaping poverty. Were they putting themselves on individual paths of upward economic mobility? which were then leading to permanent economic independence. And often the answer was no. We were offering at that time a very important hand up to stability, but not a way out of poverty permanently. 
So we knew that the city of Philadelphia had a persistent poverty problem, consistently retaining the highest poverty rate of the 10 largest cities in the United States. At 23% in 2019, and bear in mind that that is pre-pandemic, and unfortunately, that trend continues. Families of four striving to get by on $25,750 or less per year are considered as living in poverty. And all of us at ECS wanted to help break the insidious cycle of intergenerational poverty. So the ECS staff and the board searched for a way to increase our impact on the Philadelphia poverty rate. Mary Alice Duff, former chief of programs at ECS, and Julia DeMoss and John Pickering, former ECS board members, led the charge and found a like-minded institution with a similar history to ECS, and that was the Economic Mobility Pathways Program, or MPATH. MPATH helped people create and achieve their own goals associated with attaining economic independence. Things really began to move when some of the ECS staff and Julia DeMoss went up to Boston to take the two-day mobility mentoring essentials training. And there were lots of discussions about how it would work. And then in the spring of 2017, we at ECS took the plunge. Every single staff member took that two-day training. And of course, the ECS coaches were immersed and ongoing professional development to hone their coaching skills. Cynthia, I'm curious with your background in education, I know that you have a unique view on our coaching approach. Can you tell us what it means to you? I was thrilled when I heard the word coach being used to describe a methodology that we would use to support people in poverty. Athletes have coaches to help them excel. In education, we have teachers, coaches, and we coach principals. The coaching methodology is based on scientific studies and a holistic approach. People in poverty need support to move forward. They have the added burden of ever-present stress. They are constantly struggling to make ends meet and often bracing themselves against daily crises that add extra strain and trauma to their lives. And the science is clear. When the brain is focused on these worries and fears, there simply isn't the capacity for problem solving and goal setting processes needed to become economically independent. Economic mobility pathways or impact has built its whole model around this science. It is a holistic approach. Episcopal Community Services provides support in family stability, housing, well-being, physical and mental health, financial management, education training. We also know from the science that living in poverty significantly raises the likelihood of incarceration, homelessness, becoming a single parent, failing to complete high school, and even dying younger. Fortunately at ECS, we have taken the emergent science and used it to design new ways to help people achieve upward mobility. In January 2019, Mindset was born. Mindset is ECS's coaching intervention designed to create pathways to the middle class and beyond. We assign each Mindset participant a holistic coach to help the participants set their own goals and achieve them one by one. We now have just enrolled our third cohort of Mindset participants. I'm looking forward to hearing from Evan and Leslie, a coach and participant, as they describe later this evening of their experiences. 
Judy, what do you wish more people knew about poverty and the work that ECS does? You know, Cynthia, I, I think of the quote from Eli Kamarov, poverty is like punishment for a crime that you did not commit. Achieving the American dream often depends upon your zip code. ECS's work is focused on giving our participants, again, a hand up and not a handout. We are so grateful for the financial support that ECS receives from our donors so that we may make this significant difference with our work. And now I would like to introduce a video that our partner Empath created to celebrate the 140 nonprofits and government organizations worldwide that have adopted the holistic coaching model. We both are so pleased that ECS is part of a worldwide movement to disrupt poverty and to transform the delivery of human services. ECS is leading this charge in Philadelphia. So the first question I have for this group is, what is Empaths Exchange? The Exchange is a network of wonderful organizations across the United States and other countries, now about 140 plus, that are all committed to moving families to economic independence and are using mobility mentoring tools and learning to improve that work. And it's what's amazing about them is as they deliver coaching services, they're sharing what they're learning with each other. And in that way, uh, are creating an amazing, powerful hive brain that uh, allows us to evolve the practice and make our work stronger every day. The Exchange is a really wonderful learning community of nonprofit organizations across the country who are committed to ending poverty and doing it through economic mobility. The Exchange has been an amazing network of practitioners and professionals just connecting together around um, similar work, um, promoting economic mobility, um, thinking about our own communities and our own contexts, and so an opportunity to learn from one another and an opportunity to make sure that the work we're doing is um, the very best that it can be. Our next question is, why did you join Empaths Exchange? About four years ago, where ECS was in the middle of a strategic planning process, uh, we're 150 years old this year, and we have constantly evolved to meet needs uh, of the community. And that strategic plan really caused us to look at the overwhelming issues that were occurring in the city. Uh, that became to us very obvious that it was intergenerational poverty and the current processes to address that. Um, we concluded we were, as a sector, maintaining people in poverty, but we as an agency really wanted to see if there was a different way of doing this work that would, by meeting people where they are, lift them uh, out of poverty. So we went out and did a bunch of research. We found an organization in Boston called Empath, and they have, for the last now 11 years, um, had a, a management case management program that is based on the best available brain science um, and, and a coaching methodology to utilize that brain science to help people lift themselves out of, out of poverty. We were drawn to the exchange because we needed resources. We needed help. Um, more than just the basic, you know, mobility mentoring, essentials training. We needed um, information on how to apply that training to our own organization and the programs that we're doing. We needed uh, input from, more input from Empath as far as the latest research and what they, what they are doing and uh, input from other organizations uh, so we can uh, learn from their mistakes or learn from their successes, what's working, what's not. Uh, what we appreciate most are the webinars and the newsletters and the um, resources. I love to hear what 
empath is um, studying right now, what their, you know, books that they recommend or webinars or trainings that they recommend um, that just keeps us engaged and keeps us informed and um, on the front lines of uh, trying to do this with excellence. So we, Enterprise in Latinas decided to, to join the exchange after attending this Disrupting Poverty Conference in 2018. We had uh, heard of Crittenden Women's Union, we had heard of Empath, uh, we, had not, we had never been to the conference, and when we attend that we say, yes, this is it. This is the tool that will help us uh, and will guide us, and this is the right framework to guide us uh, to, you know, in the work that we want to do with individuals here in, in Waimama. Uh, in our community and, and that reflects, you know, that more comprehensive approach, you know, to addressing, you know, challenges and barriers and, and involved in, in, you know, in, in terms of living in poverty. Man, I actually joined the exchange for my professional growth and to connect with like-minded professionals. Um, and it's, it's, I've stayed engaged because I've been able to connect with individuals from around the country. And it's also helped me to stay current on proven methods um, on how to engage with the individuals that, that I meet with. Next, tell us more about how your work has changed since you joined Empaths Exchange and started using mobility mentoring. Mobility mentoring, which we at ECS call coaching, uh, is a phenomenal way of allowing the participants to take control of their life. I think about the work that I've done with ECS for almost six years. And in our beginning phase, before we started with coaching and the mobility mentoring model, it was a one directional process in which coaches or rather case managers gave participants directions and told them, this is what you're going to do. They were supposed to come back at their next meeting and bring back the completed items or the tasks that they were supposed to have done uh, since their last meeting. What mobility mentoring and coaching does is it gives participants power and control over what happens in their life. So they get to choose what activities and goals they work on and the participants are more interested and more vested in the work and what happens. Um, it's been wonderful to see people thrive and to succeed because they're working on things that they're passionate about and they care about. And so watching people flourish and obtain employment and save money and work towards getting houses and cars has been exciting and thrilling for me. And I'm just so excited about the opportunity to continue to work with participants and to watch them move forward in this mobility mentoring model. So uh, one thing that we were so excited about is when, when the first stimulus checks hit, um, I believe it was $1,200 per family. One of our families that had been engaging in mobility mentoring um, called their mentor and said, we have this $1,200 and uh, we were thinking about investing it. Can you connect us with some resources on how we can invest this money? And um, just the fact that they were financially stable enough to have the luxury of thinking about investing money instead of you know putting out fires or just buying stuff that they needed so badly, but that they had come so far from like no income to having enough income to even start wanting to learn about investing, that for us was a, a big success story. The ability of uh, the, our entire staff, you know, uh, receiving training online uh, about the model, the exchange, uh, the, the bridge, uh, the tools, you know, mobility mentoring has been fantastic, right? You know, there's a, a greater understanding and a, and a joint group commitment, you know, to going deeper and to perfecting and improving the quality of the practice uh, of the application of the bridge and also mobility mentoring. And it's really exciting to see uh, what the team is, is, is able to accomplish, right? And how the, our members are responding to the use of mobility, to the application of mobility mentoring, to the use of the bridge. The first thing that comes to mind is just starting to use that term um, mobility, that mobility mentor. Um, once I heard that, in my next staff meeting, I shared to our team, I was like, the new word, something that I want us to all gravitate toward is the word mobility, that mobility mentor. So that was like the first indicator to me um, that this program was working because that word mobility, it, it's movement. So that meant a lot. And then it was interesting how I had several components um, that are things that I was already doing in my work. But when I started to attend like the mobility um, mentoring that bridge to self-sufficiency, that type of work, it became more structured. 
it became more um, meaningful and I was able to kind of create like a flow um, to my work and it helped me to help my clients move through those barriers and those trials when when stress popped up. Um, I think the biggest thing I was going through a training and the trainings were real life experiences that were happening to some of my clients. So I was able to pause the video and put some of the information that I learned to action like in the same day. The result of that was a young lady that I was working with here in Ohio. We have um, a homeless like program where the shelters will help individuals, you know, secure secure housing. And she had been at this point before, but due to stress and other factors, it always fell through and she would just leave. Because of the information I learned through that training, I was able to give her some self, uh, some stress management tips. She stayed at the shelter and now she has her own apartment. And I really do attribute that a lot to, to the training that I had. Um, so it, it's, it's been very meaningful, um, been very meaningful to me. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we ha were an organization that maybe one to 5% of the participants that we were serving overall were getting new jobs in a given year. And now, uh, you know, those those numbers are in the 75, 76% level, you know, and you could take just about any other outcomes that we track and you'd see savings or debt reduction or increases in family stability. You know, all of those numbers have had similar trajectories. So for us, it's just been pivotal because it's, it's really taken our work and shifted it from the work of giving people fish to actually um, teaching people how to fish. And it's more than an aphorism, it's something that we know from the numbers and something that we see in our staff who have gone from you know, feeling as though they have to solve, the, as a case manager, they have to solve people's problems to actually understanding that as a coach, they can leave people with skills that will uh, allow them to solve their own problems in better and stronger ways. Everyone follows this case management model, but this is the model of coaching that we want to follow. And that model of coaching just simply states that we are the students and the participants are the teacher because they are the best at knowing who they are. So giving them a goal action plan and laying out a SMART goal, for instance, specific, measurable, obtainable, relevant is the most important part to me as a coach and all of my other colleagues as coaches, relevant and time bound. And we want to, we, we emphasize that relevancy because we want to know why you're doing it. If your why is strong enough, you can get anything accomplished that you want to get, get accomplished. And these are the things that we go through with our participants. We, we look at the bridge, the, the, the bridge. The bridge is a holistic view of a participant. You have different pillars on each side of the bridge. And you, if anyone knows about a bridge and pillars, if one of those bridge, one of those pillars are weak, then that bridge is weak in that area. So we strengthen the participant in those areas where they are weak, we help them. What do you wish people knew about poverty? One is that people that are poor don't often look like what we think they look like. There are people that work hard every day and may even have multiple jobs and still are struggling and have challenges getting the things that they need to do um, done and get the, getting the resources that they need in order to make things happen for their family. They're not lazy. Um, they're not looking for or waiting for handouts. They work hard each and every day and they want better for themselves and they want better for their families. What I also wish that people knew about the work that I do is that people that are impoverished are also, they desire and they want change. They don't want someone to give them something. They are willing to do the work and they're just looking for opportunities and connections. And once they have those opportunities and connections, they are willing to leverage those things and do what they need to do in order to move forward and to progress so that they don't need to rely on entitlements or benefits, but they can be independent and self-sufficient and continue to move forward and be successful, just like any other human being. It is possible to break the poverty cycle and that there are so many like resources and, um, organizations that are there to support through that process. So I really want them to know and to feel that it is possible.
poverty is incredibly complex and we know that it's caused by a lot of systems, economic and social systems. And um, there's so many things that impact that, such as political decisions and other financial markets. Um, and I think a lot of times we try to make it very much about the individual instead of uh, considering the systems that are at play. What I wish people could see is what we see in our organization, young families struggling, young families trying to do the right thing and trying to get ahead and not able to do that because of the multi-layered uh, difficult boundaries and obstacles that are in their way every day. Um, I wish people could take those preconceived notions about if they just worked harder, if they, you know, if they just got the right education or any of those things and put them on a shelf and just see the struggle that our families are, are dealing with and the very complex um, multi-layered problems that they have to overcome in order to just make it. What do you see as the future of disrupting poverty? One, I hope that we have many more agencies and organizations that choose to move towards a coaching model, that there's the possibility and the future of us all using the same common language, that we would all work towards uh, making uh, this process of helping people to change their life by making this a, a client or a participant-centered process and not an outside-centered process so that participants are able to work on things that matter and are important to them and to their families. I also hope that uh, legislators and the government will begin to look at this idea of making things uh, participant-centered and that we can work to strategically uh, think about ways uh, on the political level so that we can work to support our people in removing barriers that keep them from being able to attain a self-sustaining wage and support themselves and that we would continue in multifaceted ways to support individuals who have a desire to change in moving forward and accomplishing their goals, helping to make themselves self-sufficient and continuing to grow and to learn and to be a contributing citizen, which is the, the desire of most people. Right, so I think the future for disrupting poverty in general would be to continue to empower families and to design programming uh, that meets them where they are and that is um, that is able to follow them, um, that is able to support them through the process, through the long-term process of um, moving from dependency to self-sufficiency. In order to do that, our programs need to be holistic, longitudinal, um, supportive and to know where the families are at and to know where they can be and to empower them to do that. Instead of case management, we need a, a lot more of coaching and, and empowering. I see um, the future of disrupting poverty to be a real shift from thinking that um, we have to force people who are in poverty to do things, to understanding that people in poverty want to get themselves better jobs, want more education, want better housing for their family, want better opportunities for their kids, and that, that what's lacking is the, the support and the resources to partner with people to help them actually do that work they wanna do. I, I, we, it's, getting out of poverty isn't something that you have to force people to do. Um, getting out of poverty is something that you have to support and partner with people to do. And I see that transformation to putting participants in the driver's seat as a huge revolution um, that is gonna be happening in hum human services in the years to come. You know, what the pandemic has taught us is that, you know, we need to provide opportunities for people to reskill and upskill um, and look constantly looking to evolve as, um, you know, community and and offering those mobility opportunities. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, we will soon see uh, adoption kind of across the nonprofit se sector of this economic mobility concept and, and really empowering um, our clients, members, and participants with the tools they need to, to really disrupt poverty and to move out of poverty and stop those cycles of poverty. 
that was a great video. And it's just so affirming to see the enthusiasm of so many partners and ECS staff in moving to mobility mentor and moving to coaching and the power it has not only for them as practitioners, but also the participants and people um, that we serve across the United States and beyond. Also, thank you to Cynthia and Judy for their words of wisdom and their dedication to Philadelphia, ECS, and our participants. My name is Arlie Steyer, and I am the Chief of Programs at ECS. Now, let's talk about ECS's shift to participant-focused coaching and how that's going. As a social worker, I have been honored and excited to lead the programmatic changes on the ground focusing on ECS's discipline and impact. The ultimate impact, as you know, that we seek is to help individuals and families achieve economic independence. And that is what we are celebrating tonight. As you have already seen and heard this evening, the Mindset Program is a long-term program exclusively focused on this objective. There is no better way to demonstrate the effectiveness of this approach than to ask a mindset coach and a mindset participant to describe their journeys. I want to introduce Leslie and Evan, who will tell you about their experience with the mobility mentoring model and coaching. Hi, thank you, Marley. Uh, my name is Evan Coben Davis. Um, I'm an opportunity development coach um, at ECS. I've been with ECS for a little over three years. Um, and one thing that was really powerful for me when we did adopt this model and make the switch was it was really evident very quickly that this was a this was an approach that really put the power of the process um, in the participants' hand. You know, it really respected the fact that everyone's different. Everyone has their own unique way of working. Everyone has their own unique the things they want to see, their goals, their view of themselves, um, the changes they want to make in their lives. And what's beautiful to me about the coaching uh, process and the coaching approach is that we get to sit there and work with somebody to really make what they want a reality. Um, like uh, my colleague said, you know, we, we like to say that you're in the driver's seat, you're the captain. You know, I always joke that, you know, you've been studying you your whole life, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to come in here and work with you for a week or a month or a year and tell you, you know, you should do this, or, you know, I think it would be great for you to do this, you know? It's really about working um, with somebody to help them really nail down what's important to them, really lock in on their motivation about why they want to do that work, why they want to put in so much effort um, and work and determination to see those changes. And then, you know, my job is, is pretty simple. You know, we work together to strategize how to put those plans together. Um, and so I'm really just following, uh, you know, the, the leadership of the participants that I work with. Um, and that's really, that's really, uh, I think, a really empowering and special kind of way to, to do the work for me. Um, on a personal uh, note, another piece that I really enjoy about my job is I get to kind of be a mirror in a lot of ways to help people see and recognize those skills that they bring to the table, um, those strengths. That they, that they bring to the process and really celebrate um, the achievements and respect, you know, the history and the past and all those things that, 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 that uh, this person has done to get here and then, you know, to get to the next stage and the next stage. And a big part of my job is to really help celebrate those accomplishments and help continue to remind, you know, people, hey, you have these skills, you have these abilities, you have this inside you. It's just about having that space to really find it and focus it. You know, our society can, can a lot of times cannot reflect back to a lot of people, um, you know, what are some things that you're good at, right? What are some things that you were able to do? You know, the resiliency of getting up every day and going against the barriers that you see in front of yourself, right? Keep keeping your, your eyes and your mind on supporting yourself, supporting your loved ones, you know, your communities, things like that. Um, and I feel like that's a really special, you know, piece of the process. And the added benefit, one of the many added benefits, is working from that perspective and kind of with that respect of autonomy and empowerment with people that you're working with, is that it doesn't end when we're gone, right? So when, when we're done, the, the three year, the five year, however long the journey is together, um, you know, these things, because you've been working with your motivation and what's important to you, right, you get to carry that on. 
you know, and kind of like the video was showing before, it's our hope that not only do you take those tools on with you and help to, to continue to make the positive changes that you want to see in your life, but you share those, right? You share those with your family, with your networks, with your community. And hopefully that kind of change can, you know, ripple out um, and really help to affect a lot of people. Um, one of the one of my favorite things about my job is being able to sit down with somebody who quite, might, might not quite know exactly where they want to be or exactly what goals they want to set, but they have an idea. And then before you know it, after working together for so long and setting goals and achieving goals, you know, this person's able to sit down in front of you and really explain this real clear vision of, hey, this is, I, I want to do this. Here's why I want to do this. Here's why I'm going to be good at doing this. And, you know, those, those, um, that's just a really wonderful thing. And so on that note, um, I would like to introduce um, Leslie Bullock. Um, we've been working together for a little over two years now. Um, he's a participant in Mindset. And uh, Leslie, thank you for being here. And would you be able to talk a little bit about your experience uh, in Mindset? Yes, good um, evening, everybody. Well, like Evan said, I've been with Mindset for a little over two years. And prior to mindset, my life, how should I describe it? Like a tire and quicksand, spinning out of control, but going nowhere really fast. But after one faithful day on the bus, my whole life changed right before my eyes. And it was just because of a sign that I saw that had mindset written on. See, I was back then, be proud of mindset, I was a person with little vision of my future, which left me depleted of a lot of hope. But with the help of Ryan and his intern, um, um, with the help of Evan and his intern Ryan, they helped me really identify my strengths as well as conquer some of my weaknesses that I was scared to face. I'm a person from, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, where I know poverty all too well. And once I stepped into mindset and I saw the camaraderie of the workers there and how passionate they was about, you know, solving the wealth gap. I knew that was the place that I needed to be. And I'm internally in debt to mindset for giving me a vision of hope. And that's the best way I can describe it. Because I felt trapped. I felt like I was in a box. I felt like I reached my ceiling in life. But once I started mindset, I started to unravel the barriers that I was setting for myself. And like I said, I'm just in debt to mindset for giving me the confidence to be able to give myself a break and try to help myself move forward to be a productive person in society and not stand in that quicksand for the rest of my life. Wow, thank you, that was really powerful. I love the imagery of a tires and quicksand. And I think at different points in our lives, we all have had experiences of being stuck. So thank you to Leslie and Evan for sharing and really painting a picture about how mindset has been so impactful to you. As you heard, Mindset started in 2019, and since its inception, 44 participants have been coached, 117 short-term goals have been established, and 55 goals have been achieved so far, examples of which include paying off credit card debt, paying off overdue medical bills, obtaining driver's licenses, getting your dream job, making a living wage, and seeing your children graduate from high school. Additionally, 88% of my mindset participants have achieved their savings goals for our individual development account program 
where ECS matches what participants save two to one. As you could see from the Empath video, the Mindset community is an ever expanding network of participants, agencies across the world, ECS staff and donors. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce a mindset donor to you. Sue Perry moved to Philadelphia in 2015 to be near a daughter and grandchildren who were then at the St. Peter's School just down the street from our Third Street office where Mindset takes place. Sue lives in the neighborhood of ECS and St. Peter's Parish. She became interested in ECS through her parish connections and found the Mindset program to be a fit for her concern and others. I'm really pleased to be able to ask, to be asked to participate this evening. I've long been aware that poverty exists and my work for over 30 years often focused on the worldwide problems caused by poverty. As an editor of books that raised the voice of the voiceless, <clears throat> I worked with authors from around the world who wrote about issues that really affected the people in their communities. I did books on children who had been kidnapped and forced to become child soldiers or sex slaves, um, books about refugees or displaced people, books about Palestinians in the occupied territories or Gaza and books about women who lived under patriarchy in Latin America. This is a world of poverty that I knew, but never did I become so aware of poverty until I moved to Philadelphia just over five years ago. Before that, I lived in a small town in Westchester County in New York, just about an hour north of Manhattan. In these small towns, the local houses of worship banded together to support food pantries and shelters for people, people in need. And I never actually lived in a large city before. Um, Berkeley, California in the 60s and 70s certainly didn't count. And when I moved to Philadelphia, I found it life to be very different. Poverty seemed to really penetrate the greater Philadelphia area. And it, it brought a level of violence that just couldn't be ignored. And I thought, what, what can I do to help? So I started with by supporting Phil Abundance and the food pantry at St. Peter's Church, which is, as um, she mentioned, on Third and Pine, just around the corner from ECS. I first came in contact with ECS through its drive for school supplies. Every year, I would um, take my two grandchildren to Target, and we would purchase two backpacks, and one child would fill it up for with everything needed for an elementary school kid and the other one would do the supplies needed for a, a high schooler. And normally we would drop these off at the St. Peter's church office, but one year we were asked instead to take them to the ECS office. And that's when I received a receipt and was put on the ECS mailing list. And as a result, I learned about mindset for the very first time. I would have never heard of it otherwise. And I've long supported a couple of programs in particular that are long range programs. One is a school the Jesuits are building in Malawi. And another is a program that provides support and helps resettle refugees. Both are long range programs and they really grew out of my, the interests I developed during my work as a book editor. The first time I read about the mindset program in a mailing I received, I thought this is something that is different. And I immediately thought of that aphorism that Beth Babcock mentioned about fishing. This was a program that it struck me that wasn't just giving people a fish, but it was teaching them how to fish and even where to fish. And this really impressed me. This was something different. And while I'll continue to support programs like Fill Abundance, it strikes me that they, pro they do provide the immediate needed help, but it's a temporary change. It's not a permanent change. 
and mindset mindset with its with its op, its approach of coaching over an extended period of time that begins with basics like budgeting and savings and nutrition and leads up to getting a job <clears throat> that can lead to a real career rather than working in a fast food operation or something struck me as a potential that this could really bring about permanent change for a person. And it seemed to me that it had the same sort of long range positive effect as, a, as giving a child in Malawi a basic education from one to 12 or helping a family of refugees resettle in a safe environment. This was a program that wasn't just giving out fish. It was teaching people how to fish. And this impressed me so much that right then and there, I decided that I wanted to sponsor a person in the mindset program. And I, listening to the presentations this evening, I'm so impressed with the work that you do. And I hope that I'll be able to continue each year to sponsor somebody else in mindset. And I hope that all of those of you who are watching or participating this evening will join me. Let's teach more and more people how to fish. Thanks for listening to my story. Thank you, Sue, for telling your story. I remember, uh, remember well uh, your, your story and it's, it's always resonated. You, you know you're making a, a terrific difference. And I want you to know that, that all of us at ECS appreciate your support. And on behalf of the people we serve, let me say thank you. And let me say thank you to all our supporters. My name is Dave Griffith, and I'm humbled to serve as the executive director and head coach at ECS for the last eight years. Tonight, you have all received a crash course in holistic coaching and the mindset program. Rest easy, there won't be a quiz. Coaching is at the core of all that we do. And mindset, because of the length of the programs, enables the most transformational results for our participants. And I think you've seen ample evidence of that tonight. Now, it didn't take long for me to realize that to continue to live into our mission, which is to challenge and reduce intergenerational poverty in Philadelphia, ECS needs to partner with like-minded organizations, nonprofits, for-profits, and government agencies. We value our close relationship with Empath. The Empath video captures the excitement and the, and the energy around evidence-based informed poverty disrupting programs and strategies. I am very proud of my team and I'm very proud that ECS is leading this movement in Philadelphia. We are pleased to honor another Philadelphia Empath Exchange member, Lorraine McGurk, Program Director at the Achieving Reunification Center or better known as ARC, Thank you, Lorraine, for joining the movement to use coaching to help Philadelphians achieve their dreams. We are working to encourage even more human service organizations to adopt the empath coaching methodology. And remember, old problems demand new answers. And we believe mindset is that answer. We're also blessed to have close working relationships with Sonia I. Muhammad at the Beachville Family Learning Center housed at the Dornsite Center at Drexel University. Melania Cantati, who is leading the efforts at Phil Abundance in their ending hunger for, for good. And uh, also Corrine O'Connell, the CEO of Habitat Philadelphia. And of course, let me mention Liz Hirsch and Roberta Cancellara at OHS with the city. Not only is partnership a key tenet of our work, so is advocacy. We are side by side with participants to listen and serve to amplify their voice. As Judy Sullivan so eloquently stated earlier this evening, the degree to which the American dream is achieved often depends on your zip code. 
This is due to the shameful legacy of pervasive racial discrimination and the awful habit of redlining. In 2016, to answer and respond, we created an advocacy department headed up by our chief inclusion and advocacy officer, Victoria Bennett. Victoria works closely with the participants, staff, and the boards of trustees to move the ball forward on ECS's three lead advocacy initiatives. Racial equity with a focus on the local issues, elimination of the benefits cliff, and living wage. During the week of October 18th through October 22nd, ECS will be diving deep into these initiatives. We'll be doing it virtually at all of our, at our eighth annual forum on justice and opportunity. And I hope you will have a chance to get that on your calendar uh, and, and register again, October 18th through the 22nd. Now I have a great privilege of introducing Lillian Holt, a mindset participant, and now I can say an award-winning poet. Lillian grew up in New Jersey and has a lifelong interest in working with the deaf as she had a deaf teacher in elementary school. She currently serves as an administrative assistant at the Philadelphia School for the Deaf, and her dream is to earn the academic credentials necessary to provide direct services. At an ECS's coach's suggestion, Lillian entered a contest sponsored by another one of our partners, the Philadelphia Federal Credit Union, and the contest assignment was to answer two questions. What does financial security mean to you? And what financial advice would you give your younger self? Lillian, thank you for reading your poem, which won first place, we're proud to say, in the contest. And congratulations. Lillian, let me turn it to you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. This poem is entitled, The Dreams We Can Afford. It's really not in the budget right now. You'd have to get a second job. And if it's not on scholarship, I don't know what to tell you. You know we can't afford that. Well, what can we afford? Food, clothing, shelter. Paid for by labor with no shortage of gratitude, of course. Some of the most basic needs for survival. We've got God's good. Yes, you might not starve. The lights won't be shut off until next week. Still have hot water on the 16th? Miracle. But until there's confidence, not a threat, not a constant worry, not a continuous flow of mental math, not barely being able to make ends meet. We're just struggling to get by. And once we finish striving, we've made it. Our investments will have been worth it. We see the benefit of sacrifice. Our time, our freedom, our strength. Then we inhale and exhale and we inhale again. Head above water, clear blue sky, endless fields all the way to horizon. Then we can dream when the bills aren't right in front of us, when we close our eyes and we don't see debt. Then we can look past the end of the pay period. We can plan a trip. We can take a break, rent a movie, something extraneous, something extravagant, something expensive, something extra. And look, Ma, no guilt. Wouldn't that be divine? Thank you. Lillian, a great example that words matter. Thank you for reading your poem uh, and sharing a truly candid expression of your personal experience. We all wish you the very best as you strive to achieve your goals. And I have a very confident, high level of confidence that that's very much in your future. I'd like to close this evening first by saying thank you to all of you who have joined us. And I'd like to offer a quote from former President Barack Obama. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. 
We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Please partner with us to increase the impact of these poverty disrupting efforts. Share in this important transformational work with not only your voice, but also with your vote, but also we ask for your financial support. Together, let us say no status quo. Thank you. Thank you for attending and God bless. Have a safe evening.